So uh, the Red Sox fan in me is pretty impressed that you guys are here on a night that the Red Sox are going to beat the Yankees. So, first of all, I wanted to say uh, this is our first sold out My Life As event. So give yourselves a big round of applause for Phil in the Hall. I want to introduce the creator of this lecture series, the Dean of the Journalism School, Howard Schneider. So My Life As is an event sponsored, it's the lecture series for the Journalism School. It started in 2006 with war photographer Moises Samon. Actually, we were talking about it today, and Associate Dean Marcy Guinness thinks she might have been even before Moises. This is the 42nd in the series. We do three of them a semester. The purpose is to bring news literacy and journalism course lessons to life by talking to some of the top working journalists. And the other, even if you're not going to be a journalist, which most of you in news literacy are not going to do, the idea is for you to learn some transferable lessons about how does a person stumble on their passion and find something to do that is actually a career and not a job. So sit tight. I think this is going to be a very interesting evening. Credit is granted in some courses for attendance tonight. So you'll swipe your ID card on the way out. We'll get an electronic record and give you credit. I'd like you to silence your cell phones. And I'll do the same. Silence your cell phones. But we're going to be live tweeting the event. If you follow SBU, as in Stony Brook University Journalism, we're going to be live tweeting the event. And we will be accepting tweeted questions at the end. So you don't have to necessarily come to the mic. We'll be accepting tweeted questions. Use the hashtag MLA, as in my life as, GANIM, G-A-N-I-M. N as in Nicholas, M as in Michigan. OK. Duration is about an hour and 15 minutes. The format is Ms. Ganim will start up here, talk about some lessons she's learned. We'll sit here. I'll do some questions on point to journalism and news literacy classes. And then most importantly, we'll take questions from you. So here's my observation. I'm not going to get in the way too much here tonight. Sarah Ganim is the third youngest journalist ever to win the Pulitzer Prize, which is the preeminent journalism prize in America. She won it for breaking the story of the Penn State football program's cover-up of a pedophile in their midst. Assistant coach Jerry Sandusky was using the football program to lure in children, some of whom he helped, some of whom he raped. It's not like the story fell on her head. It's not like it came automatically. She actually worked on it for the better part of two years before she even started printing it. The thing that I noticed today, listening to Sarah talk with some stu journalism students, is that she uses the word we a lot. Now, when you win a big award like this, it's not uncommon for it to go to your head a little bit. But she's very clear on the fact that this was a collective effort by her little newspaper in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The other thing that I think some of you might want to explore in your questions is the great value she places on learning by doing. I'm not sure I should say this in front of my boss, but I was uh, an indifferent student. I couldn't wait to get out and actually do something real. And so I was very impatient being in school. The third thing I heard her talk about today that I think is really important for those of you who are thinking about where am I going to work and what am I going to do, she left Florida where she grew up. She's a surfer, she's a diver, she loves beaches, she moved to Penn State. There ain't no beaches up there. And I think it's one of the, my observations of students from Long Island is that they're terrified of leaving the tri-state area. So it's something to think about that she got this great opportunity by leaving the comfort of home. And finally, those of you in my lecture, you know I talk about there's only four stories in all of storydom, right? 
every movie, every book boils down to one of four stories. We tell, tell each other these stories around the campfire. And so the story of this little paper in Harrisburg winning the grandest award in journalism is a classic combination story, rags to riches, and also rescuing the princess from the scary beast. In this case, rescuing these children from a pedophile. We're going to start with a little video, and then Sarah's going to start. If you would join me right now in welcoming Sarah Gannon. Legend in the world of college football. For 23 years, Jerry Sandusky served as defensive coordinator for the Penn State Nittany Lions. Now he's out on bail and defending himself against charges he sexually abused young boys, one as young as eight years old. Two other Penn State officials accused of covering up one of the alleged incidents resigned in the wake of the scandal. The child sex abuse scandal at Penn State could prove to be the humiliating final chapter in the long and storied career of football coach Joe Paterno. University officials are reportedly discussing ways to end Paterno's 46-year tenure as head coach. The 84-year-old is not accused of any criminal wrongdoing, but critics want to know how much he knew about the allegations against his former assistant, Jerry Sandusky. For more this morning, we are joined on the phone from State College by Sarah Gannam. CNN contributor Sarah Gannam. Reporter Sarah Gannam has been covering the story for the Patriot News. She's also one of the first journalists to report on the grand jury investigation of Jerry Sandusky. Thanks for being with us, Sarah. Thank you. Jerry Sandusky jeered as he headed to county jail, his hands cuffed, the first night of the rest of his life behind bars, the jury convicting him of 45 counts of abusing little boys. A Penn State icon, now just another pedophile heading to prison. She says she's been a newspaper reporter since she was 15 years old, and now, just at 24, she just won a Pulitzer Prize. Which is not from official. Oh. Sarah Gannon wins for Sandusky County. All right. All right. They won the local reporting award for their coverage of the Penn State sex abuse scandal. I mean, you are one of the youngest Pulitzer winners ever. So I, I guess I want to start, um, I, I've been giving this speech the five things I've learned, but after listening to Dean Miller, um, how many of you in this room are actually uh, journalism majors or aspiring journalists? Okay, so for the rest of you, I hope you can take something from this. It's a little bit journalism-centered, um, uh, but uh, listen anyway, maybe you'll, uh, oh, you're getting extra credit, so I don't really care. <laughs> Isn't that how it goes? Um, you know, this story has been, is, is really interesting because uh, it had two very distinct parts. The first 18, 20, 25 months of it, um, I was the only reporter in what felt like the only reporter in the world who was pursuing it. Um, it was just me knocking on doors after filling the news hole, as we call it, uh, with, you know, random shootings, drunk guys who punched another drunk guy because he looked at his girlfriend funny, you know, all the normal crime beat reporting, fun stuff. Uh, and I would spend my nights and weekends knocking on doors and talking to people. And it felt for a long time like I was really getting nowhere. Or if I was getting somewhere and I would get really excited, my bosses would tell me I was really getting nowhere. So that went on for a really long time. And finally, we ran this story that um, basically said, I reported it, but I didn't write it, our lawyers wrote it, just basically said the facts, you know, Jerry Sandusky's been accused. And not by one boy, but by two, two boys who are 10 years apart in age and 10 years apart in their accusations. Um, and then nothing happened. It was interesting. Nine months went by and very little happened. And then November 4th, about three o'clock, when I was about to try and skip out early for the day, some clerk accidentally posted the charges against Jerry Sandusky to a website. And at that moment, the whole world cared. It was national news almost instantly. 
Uh, we knew within hours that it was eight different boys who had accused him, that most of them had been abused on Penn State's campus. Almost all of them had been abused, or, uh, had met Jerry Sandusky through his charity. And some of them were abused while he was still a coach at Penn State. Up until that point, it wasn't clear that he had done this um, while he was employed and, and on campus. And it just exploded. By the next morning, two more officials were charged with knowing about allegations and not doing enough about it, then lying about it 10 years later when they were interviewed by police. I went from being the only reporter on the story to the entire world <laughs> wanted this story. And not only did they want it, but they descended on State College, wanted to pick my brain about it, and uh, was that me? Okay. <laughs> and. Um, I learned a lot at 24 years old uh, in those, those um, weeks and months that followed that November 4th charge. So I just want to share with you guys as um, students, I was in your place not that long ago. I graduated in 2008 from Penn State. The five things that I learned, I've been sharing them not just with students but with working professionals because I think that it's really important. We're all kind of on the same playing field right now. Things are changing so much that uh, you're in the same position, it's kind of funny, you're in the same position as journalists who've been working for a really long time. We're all kind of starting over together. And so the five things I've learned on that note start with it really, really, really matters who you work for. Uh, I could have easily um, gotten a job as a clerk answering phones or writing obits at a bigger paper when I graduated from Penn State in 2008. I actually drove my college roommate to Manhattan from State College in my little silver Jetta um, and moved her into an apartment in Manhattan uh, the day after we graduated. And I was like, you know, great, this is nice. You're going to work for NBC and I'm going back to Cowtown. And, you know, she said to me something that was really smart. She said, I'm going to be transcribing tape for eight hours a day. Is that what you want to do? I was working at the Center Daily Times, which you've never heard of. I was one of six reporters, and um, I was getting paid shit, but I <laughs> was doing really, really good work. I was covering crimes. I was making a difference in the community. I was writing about issues that mattered to people. I was having a lot of fun. I was working 15-hour days, but, you know, it was important work, and I was kind of, like, small fish in a small pond, but I could make mistakes and it wasn't the end of the world. It definitely wasn't on a national scale. And the really cool thing was that I got this tip about Jerry Sandusky, right? Because if I had gotten that tip, which I probably wouldn't have, but if I had gotten that tip at um, the Philadelphia Inquirer when I was writing obits, you better believe that they would have taken it from me and given it to someone else. So. That's not really why it matters where you work, who you work for. It matters who you work for. It's not about the masthead, it's about the people. I had bosses who recognized that this was a big story, that they should pull me away for a few hours um, when we could afford to pull me away for a few hours and let me work on this. I had a boss at the time who used to say to me, before we knew about Jerry Sandusky, she would say, I think you should spend your nights, uh, some nights and some weekends investigating stories that will never be published. I thought, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but the reality is that uh, it was practice. Just like in sports you practice and in every other field you practice, uh, you know, I was practicing creative ways to get around roadblocks, creative ways to get at information when the traditional ways weren't working. And when the big story came by circumstance and by luck, I knew what to do with it. It really, really matters who you work for. When I started at, this, at the uh, Patriot News, where I work now, in the middle of investigating this story, I basically said on day one, I want some time to work on this Jerry Sandusky investigation. And I was supposed to be the morning shift cops reporter, 7 to 3. And so at 3, they would send me up 90 miles up 322 to State College to work on this. Um, and if I really had a good pitch, maybe they'd let me go at noon, or really maybe they'd let me uh, skip my shift altogether and stay up there and work on it. They talked to me in the middle of the night when I had questions. They talked to me um, 
they talked me off cliffs, <laughs> cliffs. they talked me through uh, a lot of uh, very interesting circumstances. They brainstormed with me, they gave me honest feedback, they told me when I was being dumb, and they told me when I was being smart. It really, really matters who you work for. It's not about the masthead. My, my dad used to always say, you know, when I would talk about maybe my next job, he'd say something like, is that really big enough? You know, when are you going to work for a paper I know the name of? Well, guess what, Dad? You know the paper I work for now, you know? Um, it really, really matters who you work for and not where you work. It's not about the business card. It's about the kind of work that you're going to be doing. And when you leave that first job, which should not be your dream job, because if your first job is your dream job, you've got nowhere to go from there. When you leave that first job, you've got the skills um, to do really well at your next job. And you might not have that if your, your first job is your dream job. You need that experience of working at something that um, isn't perfect, if you know what I mean. So that's my number one. My number two is very journalism-centric, so I'm sorry. But my number two is don't underestimate that people will lie to you. I had expected, as a crime reporter, that a lot of people would probably say, I don't want to talk to you, get away from me, slam the door in my face. That's all very typical. But what I encountered in this story were people who were inviting me into their homes, sitting me on their couch, giving me tea, and telling me stories that were completely fabricated for hours with the sole intention of throwing me off track. It really sent me spinning for a long time because I couldn't quite grasp, I didn't want to accept that that could be the, a possibility, that that could be true. And um, it didn't make any sense to me. If you don't want to talk to me, don't talk to me. Never underestimate that people will lie to you like that. It's a really important thing. It's an instinct that you need to have. Um, I think it's a really good idea to maybe take a psychology class or a sociology class. Reading people is a huge part of this job. You have to be socially apt. You have to be a reader and a student of people. It's really, really important. Number three, this applies to everyone. Social media matters sometimes. Uh, I love Twitter. Trust me, I'm sure you're all, I'm sure I'm all over it right now. Thank you very much. Um, it's great, it's fun, it's a good tool, but in this story, I can very confidently say I did not get a single lead or a single uh, important tip via Twitter. You're never going to get someone in this story, this kind of a story, um, with this importance to talk to you on Twitter. You're probably not even going to get them to talk to you on the phone. It really goes back to the basics, to knocking on someone's door, looking them in the eye, and saying, I know you're lying to me. I know this is what's happening. I know you're a part of it. I'm writing about it. And if you want an accurate story, you should talk to me. If you want a complete story, you should talk to me. Um, you're never going to be able to make that kind of impact via Twitter. Now, where Twitter is great, is in getting information out quickly. When this story was breaking and everyone was on it, uh, it was faster and more efficient for me to actually break news on Twitter than it was to break news on our website. Because I could do it quickly from my phone. Uh, there was no delay in posting. Everyone was there and was looking for the information. And so, uh, quick story. When Joe Paterno was very ill, and a lot of people were reporting that he had died, we got a tip that he hadn't. Actually, we got more than a tip. We got confirmation that he was alive. And um, I was standing outside the statue of Joe Paterno on campus where a huge crowd of students had gathered. I tweeted this information that I got, and almost immediately, the crowd erupted. That's the kind of impact that Twitter can have, and that's where it can benefit you if you use it properly. It's also kind of cool. Um, you can use it efficiently in other reporting situations. Um, I use it at press conferences as my notepad because I know I have to tweet. I know I have to write all this down. 
So I'm going to do them both at once. You know, I'm tweeting as someone is saying a sentence, I'm tweeting it. And that becomes my transcript of the press conference. And added bonus, my boss can read it in real time, so he's not calling me every 10 minutes asking me what's going on. Um, Twitter can be great. At uh, the first press conference, when the new president was ele uh, not elected, but appointed, people were actually tweeting at me, you should ask him this. This is what we want to know. You know, it's a, it can be a good gauge of your audience, as long as your audience isn't totally kooky, which sometimes they are. Um, but you have to know when to use it as a journalist. It's really, um, it's almost as important as, as using it is knowing when to use it. Number four, right? Did I do three already? Move the story forward. Um, news happens so fast these days. We're all in this circle, this bubble together. News reporters, uh, broadcast reporters are writing print stories for their websites, and print reporters are writing, uh, I'm sorry, are shooting video for their websites. We're all kind of in the same boat. We're all kind of huddled in the same circle. Uh, we no longer have real titles before our names. We're all reporters of everything, and we all do it all. And um, what sets you apart in situations like this, what we're really proud of at the Patriot News, is that we continuously move the story forward beyond the obvious. So I'll give you an example. I know we've gotten a lot of praise for having a lot of firsts, but we did not get the first interview with Jerry Sandusky. We did not get the second interview with Jerry Sandusky. We did not get the only interview with Joe Paterno. We did not get the first interview with the new president or the old president or the board of trustees. We didn't get a lot of very obvious interviews, what we call in the business good gets. You've all heard that, right? Because the fact of the matter is that some people are going to see bright lights and flock to the New York Times. Or, you know, 60 Minutes came to my door, I, you know, how do I compete with that? How do you say, please don't talk to 60 Minutes, please talk to the Patriot News? I mean, that, that doesn't happen, that doesn't work. Um, so as a reporter, how do you work around that? Move the story forward. It's very easy to fall into a trap where you just regurgitate the last 24 hours into a story that you run for the paper. But the last 24 hours have been on Twitter for 24 hours and everyone knows about it already. So pull yourself away from that and tell me something I don't already know. That was what um, we're really proud of in this story. We were constantly moving the story forward and telling people what's next. Why does this matter? What's the context of this news? And we did that well because we do that in every story that we write. If there's a, a shooting in a bad part of town, we, don't, we write on the web, there's a shooting in a bad part of town, here's the suspect, here's the victim, here are the charges, this is when it happened, this is where it happened, right? All the who, what, where, when, why, the inverted pyramid. The next day I'm telling you, it was a 16-year-old who shot a 15-year-old. Well, is this an issue that's happening in Harrisburg? Is it the kids shooting kids? Is, that, is this a trend? Maybe it's domestic violence, maybe they're brothers. How do I um, make this story something that people in Philadelphia want to read? Something that people in New Jersey want to read? Something that people in San Francisco want to read? Something that people in Russia want to read? Is it a story that I can tell beyond the walls of my community? It's really important. Enterprise is what's going to save this business. Enterprise is why people keep reading, even though they don't like to admit it. Enterprise is um, the reason that we are journalists. And you have to keep thinking about that. You can't fall into the trap of a 24-hour news cycle. So that's my number four. And my last one also applies to everyone, and that is lie on your time card. You're never going to get uh, a journalism job that's 9 to 5. It's just not going to happen. You have to love what you do, no matter what it is that you do. You absolutely have to love it. You have to live it. And um, quick anecdote, I got a call not too long ago from a reporter whose name I will not mention, but we'll call him Paul. He called me up and he said, hey, Sarah, I was sitting in my news truck and this woman came up and started banging on the window saying her son was a victim of Jerry Sandusky. He tried to kill himself. I think you should talk to her. Okay, Paul, did you talk to her? 
oh no, I was on my way to this event and I had to cover it. And well, are you going to talk to her later? Oh no, you know, tonight I have this thing. And well, Paul, I'm sure she works too. Why don't you go to her house on Saturday? Oh, well, you know, do you want to talk to her or not? Well, yeah, I want to talk to her, but I'm kind of curious why you don't want to talk to her. Well, you know, I'm really busy and I don't get paid for that. Okay, Paul, thanks for the tip. You're never going to break a story with that kind of attitude. Uh, you have to love what you do. You have to realize that um, this business has some financial limitations. But uh, if you're good at it and you love it, you're not going to have any time to spend money, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Those are my five things that I've learned. And I hope that you guys have some good questions. Dean? Oh, where to start? So I'm really curious about, I, I talk to my students a lot about this idea of resilience. The fact that, you know, great grades and a super high IQ end up not mattering as much in life as your ability to bounce back. So tell us about sort of the worst part of the Sandusky investigation when you just thought it was going to go nowhere or something had gone wrong. Or, and how did you pick yourself up? Well, I think I talked a lot about not getting the big stories, and um, you have to realize that you're not going to be the best at everything every day, and you can't let that kill your morale. Um, you know, I've always kind of lived by this philosophy of it, everything happens for a reason, and if you accept that, you know, even when you make mistakes that are your fault and you learn from them, um, you know, you're better for it at the end of the day. Um, I, had, I have two bosses, really, and um, one of them, every time another news organization would get a story, would freak out, and <laughs> everyone's picking it up at Giant, oh my God, you know. Um, okay, you know, it's a good story, uh, but we were never going to get, we, how do you compete with Barbara Walters? Like, I'm not going to sit here and cry about it. Um, I'm going to go out and do something that, that I can do that maybe someone else can't. And my other boss totally understands that and uh, would just laugh with me so that we could get past this faster. Um, you know, you, you have to accept your own limitations and just accept that at the end of the day there's not a whole lot you can do to change what happened except learn from it. So what's a, tell me a story about the impact that this reporting had on either one of the victims or the mom of a victim. How, I mean, we talk in the course, right, about the power of information, and we've talked in big political terms, but I want to think about a little bit with you the personal impact. Well, I, I'll tell you this story. Um, I, think, I think one of the things, the really good things that's come from this story, because there's a lot of bad in here, but one of the good things is the conversation that's opened up about child sex abuse, and actually about sex abuse, period. There's a huge stigma around the topic, and there still is, but people are talking about it a lot more today than they were November 3rd. And um, I've heard that over and over again. One example I'll give you is um, victim one, who was 17 at the time, was in the middle of his senior year of high school when the charges were filed. He was bullied out of his high school when Joe Paterno was fired. All the kids in his, his school were harassing him, beating him up, because he got Joe Paterno fired. And he had to leave in the middle of his senior year. And despite all of that, on top of the fact that the kid has been sexually abused for five years, and it was going through quite a bit anyway, um, on top of all of that, he told his psychologist a couple of days after he was bullied out of school, and his psychologist later told me, that uh, he felt it was all worth it. And the reason was because he would turn on the television and see grown men in their 40s and 50s who had no association with Jerry Sandusky but who had been abused as children by someone else, talking about it for the first time and not just talking about it in, in the comfort of their homes or in a doctor's office. They were standing in front of television cameras and talking about it with their names and their faces uh, out for the world to see and he felt it was worth it because he saw the good that it was doing. These, these men were, were inspired by his courage 
and in turn he was inspired by theirs. And you, know, you can only imagine being 17 and in that situation, and you know, that's a really good thing that's come from this story. So what about you and the newspaper? Any attempts to intimidate you by the Penn State crazies or? <laughs> well, you know, there's always, there's always hate mail. Um, in 2000 and 2007, I think, or maybe 2008, 2007, the Nittany Lion mascot got a DUI. And then he got in trouble again for something else. And of course, I was the crime reporter at the time, so I wrote about it. And I got more hate mail in the next six months, the subsequent six months. I couldn't believe it. People were calling me up in the middle of the night, you ruined this kid's life. I'm like, yes, I did. Yes, okay. Um, so I expected a ton of pushback and really didn't see that until Joe Paterno was a big part of this story in the last couple of months. Uh, but still, you know, I read all the bad mail, not all of it, I should say. I read the beginning of all of it because some of it can be really long. Um, but I, I feel it's important that it keeps you grounded. I also read all the good mail because if you read all of just the bad mail, that would be really depressing. Um, but as long as you're getting both, you're probably in an okay spot. Um, and I'm still in that place. I think that this probably says it all. I get email that says, I killed Joe Paterno, and I get email that says, I'm, I worship Joe Paterno. So I, I guess I'm somewhere in the middle. Isn't that where I'm supposed to be? So one of the impacts of being one of the youngest Pulitzer Prize winners ever is you get invited to go to all kinds of places. By the way, she's here tonight for free. So give it up for that. That's not true. I got, a, I got dinner. She got dinner. We, we got her some really great sandwiches from Fratelli's. Um, so you get invited to all kinds of interesting places. You were telling some interesting stories about going to Russia and talking to journalists there. What did they ask you that surprised you? Very interesting. Um, a lot of perspective. I think I, I definitely learn more in these, um, doing these than, than you guys do. Um, and that was definitely one of the the times that that was more than true. Um, they have no tradition of, of, the, of newspaper, of, of the press. They have no tradition of the press period in Russia because for many, many years it was government controlled. It was Soviet controlled. So they're just now starting to build up a free press. And it's very interesting the concepts they're coming up with. Uh, they do online 24-7 and they incorporate social media and they have um, a lot of they get a lot of feedback from their readers, from their viewers. They do a lot of polls. And then once a week, a lot of them put out this giant newspaper-ish type glossy, full color, um, I don't know what to call it. It's kind of like in between a magazine and a newspaper. And it's all enterprise moving the story forward based on the news that was online for the last week. So it's really fascinating. If, you had, if I had to build a news organization today, that's a pretty good model, right? Um, but you realize how good we have it here, even with um, the really bad salaries and the, um, and the long hours and the kind of wacky bosses. They, um, they kept asking me over and over again stuff like, how many times have you been beaten by the police? How many times has your newsroom been raided? I'm like, ever? <laughs> you know, so it's very, it's very interesting. So now you've been in this weird position of being the journalist covering some big story, and then you yourself have been the story at various times. What did you learn from that, from both being the writer and the person who's written about? I think mostly I learned that I must have Xanax running through my blood, because I don't think about it that much. Um, <laughs> I mean, I get asked that question all the time. <laughs> Sorry, I snorted, it's true. <clears throat> I don't, you know, um, the bottom line is, for a long, long time, it was probably a blessing that I was so, so busy, and um, just running on adrenaline every day that I didn't have time to think about it. 
I certainly learned a hell of a lot about broadcast because I basically was just thrown in front of a television camera one day and had to do it all the time. Um, there's a, there was one day I was driving from our office to um, State College. It was within the first week, and I answered my phone, stupidly, to a number I didn't know. And the, it was a guy on the other line. He said, hi, I'm a producer with Mike and Mike in the morning. You're on air. Thank you very much. You know, So you learn quickly. But um, I, I guess I, so I, I always knew the importance of all of that and being able to do it all. Um, but that certainly was the most realistic punch in the face that I could have gotten. Yes. So there's an idea that we're going to get to later in the news literacy course um, that you threw out there, and I want to just tease that out a little bit more. You talked about the danger of the bubble that we're all in together. What do you mean by that? As the a, danger? I think it's a great thing. Okay. Talk about that bubble. What is it? Well, I think that, you know, I know you guys are all in tracks, right? You're in the broadcast track or the print track or I think I heard there's an online track. I mean, the bottom line is you're all kind of in the same track because um, jobs are scarce. And if you want to work in this field, you're going to have to know how to do everything. Knowing how to do everything, though, on the flip side, will put your resume at the top of the pile. Um, and you'll be better for that. Um, I think that... You know, it's, it's humorous to me when someone says, I don't want to be in broadcast because I like to write. Well, let me tell you something. You do a lot of writing in broadcast, and it's not easy. Um, you can't say anymore, I don't have a face for, for, for television. I'm going to go into print. Well, see a plastic surgeon because you're going to be on TV. <laughs> you're going to be on the web. I don't know what to tell you guys. I mean, we're all in the same boat. We really are. It's a shrinking circle. There's no... 5 o'clock deadline, oh my, you know, 5 o'clock news, or, well, you're lucky your, deadline's not, your deadline isn't until 11 because you're in print. No, our, everyone's deadline is right now. When, when I love when PR people say to me, when's your deadline? My deadline is right now. What do you mean your deadline is right now? My deadline is always right now. <laughs> Get me in the information as fast as you can. Um, you know, that's just the nature of the business now, and I think it's a good thing. So I've got all these students who are out here looking at you and they're saying, my God, she knew exactly what she wanted to do. She prepared her whole life. That's why she's achieved this remarkable, astonishing success. So tell us the grand story about how you got into journalism. Um, there is no grand story. I stumbled into it. I also only ended up at Penn State because I was a pain in the ass kid. And... Um, you know, like I said, everything happens for a reason, and this one definitely worked out. Um, you know, I was only at Penn State a year, and I was sure I was going to go home. But not for my pride of having kicked and screamed to get there. I probably wouldn't have stayed. But, um, you know, I did, because of, I didn't want to admit that I had been wrong, obviously. <laughs> and so, you know, I worked really, really hard. And I found something that I loved to do, and I did it as much as I could. I skipped as much class as I could possibly get away with skipping. And I eventually uh, paid off. <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw that in Guaranteeing there that I'll never get tenure. <laughs> I, had to, um, I had to throw that in there because we talked about it at dinner. <laughs> so you're 15 years old, and... Well, that could go a lot of different ways. <laughs> I, I don't want that one. That's not the one I want. Uh, you go down to this event. I'm sorry. You go down to the event at the Sunset. Right. I was a, a teenager. Um, my mom probably just wanted to get me out of the house, slapped an advertisement on my bed that said, we're looking for teen reporters, freelance reporters. And um, but what I went... I fell in love with the newsroom atmosphere, but actually what really probably drew me in the most was the first freelance story that I wrote um, outside of the teen section. It was about this young girl who, uh, she was in middle school, she had a cancerous tumor in her hip, and I interviewed her, my mom had to drive me there because I was 15, <laughs> I interviewed her in the hospital um, the night before her surgery, she didn't know if she was going to 
wake up with her leg or without it because the doctors weren't sure if they could take out the tumor without, taking, without amputating her leg. And it was obviously a very sad situation. But I saw that from the story, a lot of good came. Her family wasn't too well off, and they were having a hard time, you know, driving. Her parents would have to either drive to the hospital or try to find a hotel to stay with her while she was getting chemo. But people started sending them gift cards. Complete strangers started sending them gift cards, financially helping them, you know, food gift certificates, gas cards, um, her whole school started raising money, and it all came from this story, and it was a realization that from something really bad, you can create something good, and I, you know, from that point on, I was pretty focused on when I was going to go to school, that this is what I was going to go to school for when I was 15. There was a lot of stories I could tell, though. No, 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 you can't, you can't tell those. Uh, so uh, when were you... When you were working on the Paterno and Sandusky story, when were you the most scared? Mm. Um, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have lived in a college town at some point? Okay, how many of you have been to one? How many of you think you understand the atmosphere of them? Okay, so I'll explain it this way. It's, it's to an outsider, um, to, to someone who lives there, they're very passionate. Their entire lives, their finances, everything is tied into the university. The majority of them work there. Um, a lot of them retire there. Their whole families, they have this emotional tie to the university and to the people there that unless you're one of them, you can't explain. I know it sounds really cultish, um, <laughs> It's, it's just a, their whole lives are centered around Penn State. It's, it's very difficult to put into words. Um, so that place was, it was interesting when the whole idea, their whole idyllic um, society kind of came under attack. They, it was like war to them. They were very defensive about it. And they were rioting, um, I shouldn't say rioting, they were marching through campus and town and stuff and chanting late at night before Paterno even got fired. Um, and I was with a photographer, it was just the two of us, and they started, am I allowed to swear? Mm-hmm. Okay. I do, I do all the time, he okay, doesn't no, like I'm just it. making sure because I see cameras. Um, <laughs> Um, they started chanting, fuck the media, fuck the media, and like louder and louder and louder. And these are 800 or so drunk kids at 11 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking to myself, I've interviewed murderers and rapists and all sorts of bad guys, and I have never feared for my life ever until now. Um, because it only takes one of those drunk, delusional kids to decide they're going to come after us. And what do you do, you and a photographer, against 800 people? Um, they didn't. We kind of just went the other way. But that was um, quite a night. So how do you discover the difference between a career and a job? I, mean, you, I don't you think touched you discover that, that. I think you just know. You know when you're doing something that doesn't feel like work, and you know when you're doing something that does feel like work. I've had a lot of jobs that feel a lot like work, and you're just constantly looking at the clock. You don't really want to be there. Um, you're working because you have to. You know it. I don't have to describe it. You guys all know. It's like being in his class. <laughs> okay. Okay. Your turn. Uh, We are taking (laughs) questions via Twitter, and there's also the two microphones. So let's hear, do you have a Twitter question for me yet? Sorry, sorry. Oh, wait, while we're warming up that, what does Hike Happy mean? Uh, Hike Happy is the name of her website. No, 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 that's not, yeah, it's the name of my, my sister and I started a photo blog, but I think that we, so, 
This isn't going to make any sense. We wanted to call it Wanderlust, but it was taken. So we started Wikipediaing Wanderlust and somehow decided that that is the origin of it. I'm going to blame it all on her. Not my idea. We have a Twitter question from Leah W. Your journalism career sped off in a blink of an eye. Did you ever picture something different for yourself? Um, different from journalism? No. I mean, I enjoyed doing a lot of things. Um, I really enjoyed teaching. I miss that a lot. Um, but I think this is my first passion and certainly uh, was going to continue doing this no matter what, this story or no. I mean, I was perfectly happy, a happy reporter uh, before this story. So. Probably more happy than I am now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll keep, go ahead. Loud. No. No? Microphone. <laughs> microphone is coming. No such thing as loud without a microphone. Hi. Uh, you say you love teaching. A lot of our professors here are working journalists. Did you ever think about being a professor of journalism? Uh, well, I did teach a class at Penn State, actually, this the semester that uh, we broke the story, which was interesting because I work 90 miles from Penn State, so I was driving up every day for my class, and the whole ride up, I was like, are there going to be bars on my door? Are they going to let me teach this class today? Um, and actually, we didn't talk about it at all because I was so terrified that they were going to tweet something I said. So um, that day, we just didn't discuss it. Um, but I, um, so I did teach that one class, and unfortunately, I can't continue because of the hectic schedule that I have now. But um, I had 20 really brilliant kids, and I miss them a lot. Oh. <laughs> Who else has a question? First of all, thanks for coming. I really appreciate your talk. Um, my question was, you were obviously very successful um, with this story, and I'm guessing the story is somewhat ended. Do you worry about now when people see a, a column, Sarah Gainham, they think it's automatically going to be a, a child sex abuse story and how you reinvent yourself, or if you want to, do you feel committed now to that work? Or do you start no, that? actually, I'm, you know, I've been working on this and nothing else for 10 months. And I'm to the point now where, you know, the story's far from over, and I'm not going to abandon it by any means, but I'm ready to work on something else. Um, I think that's really important for, I've been talking about that, being diverse and knowing how to cover a lot of different things. I'm really happy that, having covered crime for a long time, I'm really happy to see that it did um, open up a conversation about sex abuse, but I'm not down the advocate track at all. I mean, it's, you know, I want to continue being a reporter. Hi. Um, thank you for coming here for free today. But what I want to ask was, why did you come here for free? <laughs> uh, good question. <laughs> I really enjoy this. Um, and I didn't have to go to work today, so... <laughs> I really do enjoy it. Um, I probably won't be able to do it this much for very much longer, so I do have to go back to work eventually. And um, as long as I can squeeze it in, I'm happy to do it. Um, Newsweek magazine named you one of the 100 women who shake the world. By what means have you been taking advantage of such recognition to influence women? Well, you're making me feel really good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not that much, now that I think about it. I thought that was a little weird because I don't think I did anything to shake the world. You know, you have to think about, this isn't about me. Um, this is about those 10 boys that came forward. This is about a lot of other things, a lot of other people with a lot more courage. I mean, I'm happy that it opened up a conversation about local journalism. That It did, it, it did more to um, restore faith in local journalism, and not just local journalism, I shouldn't say, because all reporting is local to some degree, but um, journalism, period. You know, I s still do, but a little bit less. Get the emails. I used to get them all the time. I wouldn't wipe my ass with your paper. It's so thin. And you guys are, you don't do the kind of work you did when I was growing up, or when I was the reporter in the 
I don't know, 1730s, we did a whole hell of a lot more. Thank you, you know, and I always hated that. <laughs> Do you have a sinus infection? <laughs> No, I do not. <clears throat> um, <laughs> do you have any other sound effects in there? That's it. That's the <laughs> full extent of my repertoire. I always hated that because we do good work and the 99.9% .9 of reporters don't have an agenda except that they want to do good journalism. And so... I was really happy to see that this this was a a win for all of us in all newsrooms, you know, that that um we were able to kind of say, see, I told you so, we, we are still doing good stuff. So I don't know what extent that shakes anything, but I have a question that a journalism student sent to me this week. Uh let's see. She wants to know how you were able to use youth to your advantage when breaking the Penn State story. From my own experience, she writes, as a journalism student, I find that looking young can hurt me when I'm reporting because people don't always take me seriously. I'd be interested to know how she was able to get past this in order to uncover such a groundbreaking story. It definitely, um, that's true, but you can also use it to your advantage. I think that sometimes, um, people will um, underestimate you, too, because of that. And so you just got to roll with it, you know? I mean, use it when you can. And when, when pe people talk down to me all the time, uh, so, OK, you know, that's good for you. Um, I'm not going to let it affect my work. You got to realize that people are going to do that. But I, I should say this. Um, I have male reporters all the time tell me that I have it easier than they do. So I think that there's, which I don't agree with, I mean, I think that we all have strengths and weaknesses and you have to use the strengths to the best of your ability and then recognize the weaknesses and you have to deal with it. I mean, I think that, I think that the way you present yourself is probably the most important. Um, you show up in, like dirty clothes and you smell like, I don't know, shit. <laughs> I mean, people aren't going to talk to you, but if you're wearing like normal, you know, a normal outfit and you're not like have purple hair and earrings coming out of weird parts of your face and tattoos on your, sh I had an intern who had a tattoo right here. I was like, yeah, I'm not taking you anywhere. Because um, no one's going to talk to you. They're just going to look at your tattoo the whole time. It's being presentable and kind of blending into your environment, and that's why I, I kind of go back to that. I'm, on, I'm not on TV. I can dress however I want. No, you can't, because people won't talk to you if they don't feel comfortable with you. So um, I lied about my age for a long time. That works, too. <laughs> There's a question over there. Hi. 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 Um, obviously, there's a lot to verify when you're breaking a huge news story you did. How did you gather the information, and uh, can you really explain the process? What was the last part of that? Can you explain the process, how you gathered and verified oh. the information? Uh, yeah, it was a lot of little pieces. I actually talked to more than 30 people for that first story. We set a really high bar. We said you know, only one person was on the record. So we said, if we're going to have anonymous sources, we, we need to have five of them for the main part of the story. And then depending on the different facts, you know, we had talked with lawyers about how, um, how many sources we had to have for the rest of the facts. It was a lot of little pieces, and the big challenge was stringing them all together properly and kind of creating this timeline. Um, it wasn't, there was like, there was no big moment. Uh, it was a lot of work for a long, long time, and then and a lot of getting feedback, uh, talking to lawyers, talking to the bosses, spent a lot of time on the conference calls in their offices. Um, and then one day, they, the, you know, our lawyer just said, OK, you, know, you guys are ready. You're, you're finally there. Um, and we all kind of just looked at each other like, wait, what? <laughs> we never expected that to happen. 
because for a long time I'd come back with something that I thought was great and she'd say, yeah, no, you don't have enough. But she, she would say something like, you don't have enough, but if you get A, B, C, and D, then you can use it. So we always kind of had a goal. And I always knew what I was set out to do. I also would make lists, either mentally or actual lists, of people and associates. And I would just, you know, if, if person X won't talk to me, well, who else does person X know? Or just brainstorm about who else might know that piece of information and just knock on doors until you got there. And you're not being metaphoric. I mean, you were literally going out. And oh, yeah, knocking literally on doors. knocking on doors, yeah. Right. There's a question here. Hi. Um, so you talked earlier about getting a random tip about the whole story. I know you probably can't say a name or who actually told you, but can you tell the story of how the tip got to you specifically being sort of the youngest reporter at the newspaper? Yeah, I, it was very standard. I was just having a conversation with someone about something else late at night in the newsroom on the phone, and um, I was pretty obsessed at that point with proving that I deserve this job at 20 years old. And um, I would was trying to build a source base so that I kind of had eyes and ears everywhere in the community. And so I would always ask people, you know, like, what else do I need to know? Who else should I talk to? What else is going on? Something along those lines. And I said, you know, anything else going on? And this person said, yeah, actually, Jerry Sandusky's been accused of molesting a little boy. Actually, I think it was Jerry Sandusky's been accused of raping a kid at his house during sleepovers. And I knew he was a charity founder. So that immediately in my crime reporter brain was like, oh, that's a big deal because he has a children's charity and he's accused of raping a kid from the charity. Um, I didn't know that he was associated with football at that point. Uh, I had to Google him to get the whole <laughs> picture. He'd been gone for 10 years at that point. That's no excuse, but um, that was how it started. Actually, that person, though, that source, called me back six weeks later and said, hey, remember that thing I told you about Jerry Sandusky? It's not true. And um, I believed it, actually, because I had no reason not to. It wasn't until his charity fundraiser the following August, which would have been like five or six months later, I had to cover because it was on a Saturday. And I went, and he wasn't there. And I thought, that's really weird because he's the reason people go to give, you know, give money. He's how they raise money. So I started asking people where he was, and I got two different answers. It turns out they had decided at the charity not to let him go because of the accusation. So they had talked about it, but they never talked about what to say when people asked where he was. So I got two different answers, and that was a huge clue that something was up. We're about due for a Twitter question, too, after this one. So if you've got some. Can you hear me? Not really, no. Go ahead, just hold it close to you. Hold you it broke close. it. It's a, hello, yes, it's hello, on. Hello. Go ahead. Good? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so my name's Nico. I'm actually, I was attending Penn State last year oh. while you were breaking this whole story. Uh, I, no, I'm a big fan. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't one of the crazy 800 guys. Are there your metal detectors? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, so I definitely understand why the media, like, saw the Penn State student base as like sort of a crazy obstructive crowd because by and large they were. But I'm wondering, did you ever find the student body helpful to you while you were covering this story? Um, I didn't do a whole lot of scene stories during that time because I was focused on the investigative part of it. I never, I didn't get a whole lot of anger directed at me personally until recently. Um, you know, I'm an alum, so, uh, you know, obviously I have, I can credit Penn State for my degree. Um, I, you know, I did one or two stories about kids who were in the Paterno in the media class, which they did have. Um, and it was an interesting gauge of what the student body was thinking on a more intellectual level than writing. Um, but I can't say that, 
you, the story wasn't really about students, so I can't say that they were really that helpful. There's a Twitter question. Yeah. Okay, Twitter, we'll have a question. Twitter question. This question is from Heba Hips. Did you ever feel like you were betraying your Penn State pride by breaking the story? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I first of all, I covered Penn State for a long time before the story, and covered a lot of a lot of disappointing things. I think about the university. You know, every university has tribulations. That's for sure. Um, not Stony Brook. I don't know. You've been snorting, so that's probably one. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I. I was very used to the walls, you know, we could never get any information out of Penn State. We called them the Kremlin. I, you know, it was like, it, to me, as a reporter, you have to compartmentalize your emotions in stuff like this. Um, it just never was an issue. I, I, you know, like I said, I owe them my education, but I think I love my job and I love the craft of reporting more than myself or what I feel or more than I love Penn State, you know, it's not, a, it's not about me, it's not about them, this is about a story and telling it accurately, and so while I have been accused of that quite often, I actually kind of feel like I did exactly what they taught me to do. Here you go. Hi, my name is Atiba Rogers, and I wanted to know if there was a journalist who you em emulated or if you just came into your own. I definitely have had a lot of mentors. Um, one of them, Pete Shellam, you guys have probably never heard of him, but you should all Google him. He was a reporter at the Patriot News before me. Um, he got five people out of jail through his reporting over many years. Um, he was great. He was a friend of mine. He never saw me as a little twerp 20-year-old who was constantly nagging him with questions. He was really helpful, down to earth, taught me a lot of investigative skills, really got me thinking. Um, and John Curley was a professor of mine when I was at Penn State. He's the founding editor of USA Today, was president of Gannett for a long time. He, to this day, is a huge mentor of mine and someone who I always bounce ideas off of. Um, we have another question. As a woman, do you find you had more difficulty in breaking the story than if you were a man? We can't hear you. Repeat the question. Hold the microphone closer. Um, as a woman, do you find you had more difficulty in breaking the story about Jerry Sandusky than you would have if you were a man? I think. Can you yell a little bit louder? As a woman, do you find that you had more difficulty in breaking the story about Jerry Sandusky than you would have if you were a man? Oh, um, I didn't ever think about that. Um, people, people, that's another one I get asked a lot. And uh, You know, um, there's been some columns written about this, I'm told. I think it was more that I wasn't a sports reporter covering that beat, that I was from the outside. I think it was less that I was a woman and more that I didn't have to, um, this wasn't my beat. It was kind of like I was an outsider um, approaching this from a crime perspective and not from a sports perspective. It really isn't a sports story. It, it's saying it's a sports story, you know, a lot of people do, because figures have, are related to sports. Until the NCAA sanctions, it was, it was not a sports story. Only when the NCAA sanctions came down and it started to affect the program. Was it a sports story? It's kind of like if your former university president, who's been retired for 15 years, was accused of this, would you say it's a story about education? I mean, it's not, would you say that this affected your degrees or your classes? No, I mean, it's, no, this was a story about people involved in sports, but it had nothing to do with the, the players or the team or the program, really. Um, so, I think a lot of sports reporters who aren't used to investigative journalism didn't really know what to do with what bits of rumors they were hearing. And as a crime reporter, I knew exactly how to approach that. So I think that's the difference. I don't think it has anything to do with being a woman. 
Um, why did victim one's therapist release his statements to you? Well, he was allowed. I mean, his victim one allowed him to. Hi there. Uh, I was wondering what kind of effect your success and national recognition got, had on your family, like your immediate family. Like you mentioned you had a sister. Does she think she's super cool now because you're super <laughs> cool? Or is, are they more like proud and humble? Unfortunately, my sister had thought, has thought she was super cool from the moment she came out of the womb. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, I'm very grateful that she ha I was really worried about her because she looks a lot like me and she's on campus every day. Um, but she had nothing but um, support and kindness from people up until recently when things, um, some people have been contacting her, which I'm pretty pissed off about. But um, no, I, I'm really, I was really worried about her and I'm really glad that she hasn't had backlash. Um, you said that everything happens for a reason, but what was your initial reaction when the clerk posted the story about Sandusky on the internet? Uh, I said, holy fucking shit, they charged him. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember how she said that she was really drawn to the newsroom atmosphere? It's because they allow people to talk like that, I'm guessing. <laughs> we knew that he was going to be charged that week. Um, we actually thought it was going to be Monday. It was supposed to be Monday. So I had been working um, weekends, like coming in on weekends, just preparing, getting all of our crap together, writing background, as much background as I could. I was calling people saying, can we talk generally about pedophiles and what they do in society? I mean, it was really cryptic. Um, but I thought, you know, we've, been, we've done all this preparation. We know it's happening on Monday, so I'm going to go home early and sleep, and then I'll come in tomorrow. And just as I was going to leave, I, yeah. So, oh, there. I got that from you. It's the air. <laughs> Here you go. Um, I was curious about how you felt about the decision to restrict the Patriot News' publication to three days a week. Can you repeat that one? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was curious as to how you feel about the decision to restrict the publication of Patriot News. I think it's a great idea. I think it's really innovative, um, really smart, forward thinking. You have to understand the whole, the whole context of it. They're not actually eliminating pages. You of need to print. explain that. Go backwards and explain the decision. Ah, first right. So the Patriot News, where I work, starting January 1st, is going to go to three days a week publication instead of seven. And the whole idea is that it's an online focus. So reporters are being told, you no longer work for the newspaper. You work for the website. And um, what they're going to do is feed the, you know, feed the website constantly, which is what we all should be doing anyway, and then use that content to put together enterprise stories for the newspaper. They're actually printing, um, instead of seven or six days a week thin papers, they're printing three Sunday size papers a week. Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Um, and I, I think it's really smart. I told you about my visit to Russia and what they did. I think it's a great idea. I think that it's, you know, you, you have to take risks. I'm not, I'm not saying that um, I'm 100% sure it's going to work. I don't know. But I'll tell you this, what we're doing now isn't working. The current model is certainly not um, that popular. And so I'm really proud of the new houses. I think it's great that they're trying something new and different, and at least they're trying, you know, to, to create a product that is more in tune with what people need today. I don't think that anybody who would start a news organization today would start in the model that we have. Way back. Oh. When you were in college, did anyone try and tell you that you shouldn't be in journalism because it's hard to get a job? If so, how did you ignore their comments and keep moving forward in your career? A lot of people, yes. That's good um, mostly with what I was saying before, they would roll their eyes and say, well, that's a dying industry, you know. <sighs> it's not dying, it's changing. Um, I was at NYU this morning 
And a student asked me, he said, with print dying, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I didn't even hear the rest of that. Don't ever say that again. Print is not dying. First of all, there's always going to be a need for journalists, no matter what the forum is. Um, the, the world would not survive without them. I'm, it's one of the only professions that's actually written into the Constitution, if you really think about it. The president and journalists. Not uh, Congress, but who cares about that? <laughs> I forgot that one. Um, you know, so people are mistaking the, the medium for the job, and those are simple-minded people. Um, yeah, we have another question. Hello. Um, so being the third youngest winner of the Pulitzer Prize in history, there must be some like, significant pressure to continue as excel as you have. Um, are you worried about never finding another Sandusky story, and what's next? Oh, this is my favorite question. Yes, I peaked at 24, and I'm ready to retire. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's next. Uh, right now, what's next is I have a 3.30 a.m. wake-up call to catch a flight back to Harrisburg. I, you know, I can't plan that far ahead. I, like I said, I hope to be able to continue reporting and doing good work, and, you know, it's not something you can plan um, to do stories like this. Um, you know, when they happen, the best you can hope for is that you're prepared for them. So people like to say, oh, I can't wait to see what you're doing next, and, like, chill out, people. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of luck in a lot of circumstances, it's knowing what to do with it when it happens. Yeah, my question for you is, it sounds like getting information for some stories are dangerous. So what do you do to protect yourself? To protect myself? Um, I don't think about that that much. <laughs> Sorry, that's a boring answer. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, I realize that you um, uncovered the scandal, but how closely did you work with prosecutors on like actually charging Sandusky? Oh my gosh, not at all. No. No, no, no. I mean, no, not at all. <laughs> I, they actually dislike me quite a lot. Yes. Sarah, thanks for coming. Uh, can you talk about Joe Paterno? Is he such an interesting figure, uh, a saint, a tragic figure, a villain? Why, what in your mind happened there that he heard about something Sandusky supposedly did and didn't go to the authorities by himself? Was he really just protecting his program? Or could he not really deal with the horror of it, do you think? I don't really have an opinion on that. I mean, I, there's a lot of pieces of information out there, um, the story isn't over. I think that maybe with this next trial we'll learn a little bit more, I don't know. We might never know, I mean, the guy is dead, so it's, you know, it could be an unfinished story. I think one of the big lessons, though, out of this is it's not fair to hold a human being to such a high standard. It's not fair to that person, but it's also really not fair to the people who worship him. I mean, it's really, we're all equal, we're all humans. We all make good decisions and bad decisions and the idol worship that occurred around that man was really unhealthy. And I just think that it's just not, it's not a good, um, it's not a good thing. And I, that's nothing, I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but I just don't think it's a healthy, I don't think it's healthy to worship other people and for a variety of reasons. So we don't have time for another question. We could invite Sarah back again. Uh, we could invite her back to teach for a semester, right? If you, if you want to come. Oh, I would love that. But at, would you like that, by the way? You think that's a good idea? <laughs> so if you're getting scanned, if that's a verb, if you're getting scanned, you're going to go out this way. And please join with me in thanking both our host, Dean Miller, and Sarah Gant. Thank you very much.